How many people know what FIRST is? Thank you. And to the rest of you, it shows you what a failure I actually am. Uh, about 20 years ago, slightly more than 20 years ago, I decided we got to fix the culture of this country because I figured if we didn't 20 years from then, we'd be seeing unemployment, we'd be seeing that we've lost our global competitive advantage, we'd be seeing all sorts of things that probably won't happen, but anyway, uh, it seemed to me that everybody in this country focuses on things, as you've heard all morning, they, they use 19th century mindsets and maybe 20th century tools to look at 21st century problems. And in business, it's always supply and demand, supply and demand, supply and demand. And the business of America is business, and it's, it's work. But even in the way we speak, we sort of set a very tight ring around our potential solutions. Because I don't think it's about supply and demand in all cases. I think the more important one sometimes is it's about demand and supply. In education, for instance, even 20 years ago, we outspent the rest of the world per capita by just almost un thinkable, unconscionable amounts of money on education, and yet we get pretty dismal outcomes. Over the last 20 years, if anything, it's gotten worse. The rest of the world's figured out how to create, among kids, extraordinary uh, capabilities, particularly in math and science and technology, because the kids are passionate about it. They realize it's a way to create wealth, to solve their problems, health care, energy, et cetera. And this country continues to think we can throw money at these old systems, as you heard, we'll put Ritalin into kids, and it's not gonna work. So I decided 20 years ago, start with that, clear it right up, and don't start with supply and demand, start with demand and supply, and create an organization to create that demand. In a culture like America, we easily had, by then, today even more so, created demand for two things, particularly among kids. Our national pastime isn't a pastime. Like most sports now, it's an obsession. And the world of entertainment is what drives most kids. So I decided we need to steal from the playbooks of sports and entertainment and find a way to get kids as passionate about thinking, learning, problem solving, as they do with things that ought to be pastimes. The problem with it was, the only way you can get kids to focus on sports and entertainment is to put in front of them the superstars of sports and entertainment. And there's no shortage of that in this country. Where was I going to get the superstars of science and technology since those people are generally busy off doing what they do? You know, keep the lights on and the water clean and security up. And they don't have time and our culture didn't give them a way to access kids, or more importantly, kids to access them in a fun environment. In fact, when our culture does show kids science or engineering, it typically, as an adult, shows a middle-aged white male in a lab coat, frizzy hair, German accent, sociopath, out to, <laughs> out to destroy the world. And if we show kids uh, somebody interested in math, science, or engineering as a little kid, it's a geeky, squeaky kid if it's a guy, and it's a certainly unattractive woman if it's a young girl. So it's worse than we don't create these heroes. We make cheap jokes out of it, but those jokes have a consequence. So my epiphany was all we have to do is find a way to get world-class people from the world of science and technology in front of kids in the same kind of fun, exciting environment as the Super Bowl or a rock concert. Kids will change their attitude, they'll focus, and the world will be a better place. Seems easy. Just change the culture back so that we get what we celebrate in this free country. We'll start celebrating the right thing. Interestingly, this week, by the way, one of the great, great, great initial supporters of FIRST passed away here in Chicago. I think multiple generations of his family have had a big impact here. Bob Galvin at 89. He was about 69, 20 years ago. He was one of the first people I asked to help me build this crazy new idea where we're going to turn math and science and engineering into fun and put it in front of kids in a way that they'll just get passionate. 
And more than 20 years ago, when it was just a vague idea, I had to go to some big visionaries that would believe this crazy idea that you could make math and science more fun than a bounce, 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 throw event. And I, w I went to a few people. And one was Bob Galvin. Since I'm going to run out of time to tell the whole story at first, I'll just very quickly tell you. It took me a year or two to arrange the first sporting event with our league. Our league was only 23 companies that each adopted a local school from wherever they were. And it took me the whole country to get 23 world-class technology companies to put their superstars at our disposal. You know, Boeing out of Seattle, and Motorola out of Chicago, and Baxter, a big partner then and still a partner of mine today out of Chicago. And they all sent teams to Manchester, New Hampshire to get their kid apart and was sent away to take the typical. Our model was a high school sporting event, six, seven, eight intense weeks of preparation, and then a double elimination tournament with school bands, cheerleaders, and the works. They all left, and in the middle of February, they came back to Manchester, New Hampshire. That's commitment. Uh, and we had our double elimination tournament in a high school gym. One event covered the whole year. Every one of those 23 companies agreed they'd come back the next year if I made these little 10-pound kits a little bigger, more stuff in it. Motorola, by the way, does, by the second year was giving us radios and controls. And today, by the way, Dan Green, a former Motorola guy who's now our Chicago guy, is downstairs in this building. You got to go see him and the kids from some of our teams that are here today. In any event, uh, each year, we would make the kit bigger and better. After five years, I had to tell everybody, we have to break with the tradition. January, I'm going to give you your new kits. You can't come back to New Hampshire for the championship, because after the fifth year, there was no venue in New Hampshire big enough to hold it. So we moved it to a little place that understands excitement and fun and entertainment and kids, a little place called uh, Disney, Epcot, in Orlando. And for five years, we kept doubling and redoubling the size of this volunteer-driven organization in championships in Orlando. But we realized, we realized we had run out of Fortune 500 giants that have the resources to take kids and parents and teachers and put them on airplanes and put them in hotels just to play our sport. You know, if the Super Bowl could inspire kids, but then in order to play, kids had to get on airplanes, be put in hotels, and be teamed up one-on-one -on -one with NFL superstars, that's not a scalable event. So we convinced some of those early companies, like Motorola, that had seen the positive impact. You've got to start regional events all over the country that will happen for March Madness, throughout March, and then we'll go to Disney. That way, small and medium-sized companies, that's where you all come in. This whole thing is nothing but the lead-up to give you your homework assignment of getting the rest of the Chicago schools involved, which will be a way to help maybe the other group that was standing here. Well, Motorola was the first company to stand up and say, we'll do a regional. And the first year, we did regionals in year six. We did two of them, one in New Jersey and one sponsored here by Baxter and, and Motorola. They've been doing it every year since. By our 11th year, we were so big, we outgrew the temporary arena they built us at Disney. So we moved our championship at the end of that year to the Astrodome in Houston. We moved out of there after a year, and for the last six years, did it at the home of the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. And last year, we moved to the 80,000-seat dome under the arch in St. Louis. Also, since the whole thing was prove that you can become part of the culture, change the culture, I needed that aspect of it. And since our Super Bowl is so big, uh, we decided, like the other Super Bowl, that 20th century model, Acro McGillic guys jump. Uh, anyway, uh, I decided we needed our own halftime show, and Will I Am and the Black Eyed Peas uh, were doing this halftime show for the last year's Super Bowl in Texas. Uh, they agreed to come do the halftime show and a whole concert for us this year. And uh, we're going to tell you some really exciting stuff about what we're going to do next year. But since I'm really going to run out of time, and I want to show you a video from another guy that agreed to come help us, the voice of God. I'm not that compelling. But when God tells people to do something, they do. And uh, I invited Morgan Freeman to uh, get involved. 
and said, Morgan, you got to give us like a three minute story. Put something together that I can show people and tell them they got to get involved. So I have to save my three minutes for that. And I now realize that means I got to really scream. I am, since you might think I'm just kidding here, I'm going to show you the fastest history of FIRST with one or two funny stories and hopefully some very serious statistics and just a bunch of pictures. So it's a not-for-profit for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. The word education isn't in there. Don't explain to me. I don't know how to teach it. You're here to help kids understand the difference between fact and nonsense and what's important and inspire them. Five circles was taken. I figured I'd take three more interesting shapes. And Anyway, 1992, we kick off. I told each president since then, you throw out the first year, baseball season of the year, you w bring the winners of the Super Bowl and you bring the winners of the World Series to the White House every year. That's a powerful statement to America, to kids about what's important. You've got to bring the kids that win our competitions to the White House, and every president since 1992 has done it nearly every year. Six weeks after that picture was taken, this is the championship in a high school gym in Manchester. Everybody in the world that knows what first is, is in this picture. The playing field is that 12 foot by 12 foot arena, they're picking up tennis balls. The following year, new president brings the kids to the White House. As I said, there's some funny stories here. He gets his picture, he gets, sorry, he gets his shirt in his picture. And I said, Mr. President, you like everybody else have to support first. The shirt's 15 bucks. <laughs> he paid for it. Then we outgrew everything. We moved to Disney. Seven years later, we tell Disney we can't come back next year. So on that year, they shut down the park at the end of the show. And they made the most spectacular party for our mentors, our sponsors, the teachers, the volunteers, because they said this was the best partnership they'd ever had. Now we have 80 pound machines. These kids are doing a great job here in the Astrodome. Next few years, there we are at the home of the 1996 Olympics. Yep, the new president brings not only the high school kids, but the ones in pink are our little league, like every other sport. The little kids get turned on. Yep, you can chase the president around the White House with a 120 pound robot and no, the Secret Service has no sense of humor. So <laughs> this is what it looks like in the pits. This is what it looks like on the field. 38% of the kids that participate on these teams are women and minorities. That's not the same representation of those groups in science and technology, patent holders, etc. Little South Korea now has about 500 Lego League teams. They won the championship. We have a mid-level. You'll see that downstairs. I don't have time to show the whole thing. We're going to run out of time. We have teams coming from Africa. This team came from Ghana. Here's some of our data as of last year. I'll have to really scream through it. But in the 1,800 high schools, 11 countries, 1,100 teams in our new competition, among the first Lego League, we had nearly 15,000 schools last year from 56 countries. Most of you would like growth like this. At least you think I'm making this up. The Ford Foundation paid Brandeis to do a longitudinal study. We didn't get to even access the data, never mind control it. This is what they determined. Kids are three times more likely to major in engineering, nine times more likely to do internships. They see what their mentors are doing. Four times more likely to pursue engineering, two and a half times. Among women, a 400% change. Among minorities, we double the number of kids that get it. Last year, we had 130 universities fielding teams. So this is one of my great accomplishments. It's one thing that our whole culture is obsessed with sports and entertainment, and the sports and entertainment people should be. It's how they make their living. Without fans, they... But our culture is so perverse that our university system is known mostly to the kids, inner city kids, our institutions of a higher learning are known for, you know, the Razorbacks, the corn huskers. Do they have an engineering school, a medical school? Now, I don't let universities field a team to get access to a million kids unless they actually give scholarships. So last year on stage, 
in Atlanta, I mean, in St. Louis, we handed out $15 million in scholarships. But the big win here was I now actually have universities giving scholarships to scholars. It's a weird concept, but this is America. <laughs> Anything could happen. A really fun story that I, I, every year I invite all the former presidents back. A couple of years ago, Mr. Bush said he'd come. I didn't tell anybody because, as we all know, presidents are remarkably unreliable people. <laughs> all day Friday, elimination tournaments are going on. Late Friday night, we're getting set for Saturday morning's championship event. You'll all be invited this year, St. Louis, April 26th to 28th. I hear that he has, he told me, arrived. Seven o'clock in the morning Saturday, I go down to the green room, see the president. You know, he's nearly 80. He hasn't been there since the first year, 16 years before that. Lots have happened since then. I'm afraid he might pull out the paper and do the political talk. These kids are ready to hear the national anthem, start the championship, do the, and it's going to be a mutually embarrassing thing. I try to make a couple of statements. Mr. President, remember, this is a, very wryly looks at me and said, Dean, I remember how unusual first is, at which point somebody comes in and says, they're getting ready for opening ceremonies. We run out the back way, we go on stage. I say, hey everybody, before we get started today, I have a special guest. He was here when we started this thing, before most of you were born. That shows you how fast the world moves, not for us, but these kids were 17. I said it was very convenient that he believed in us because at the time he was the President of the United States, and he's here to see how we're doing and say hello. And of course, he gets a nice ovation. He walks onto stage, he goes to a podium, and he pulls out the paper. And I'm thinking, no good is going to come from this. <laughs> but he looks up at seven tears, and he goes, wow! This is just like WWF. <laughs> and the first thing that goes through my mind is, did he have to pick that sport? <laughs> And the second thing that goes to my mind is, does he watch that crap? And, and there's a nervous laughter, but he's a very wry guy, and it was a very well-delivered joke, because he looks up and he goes, wow, this is just like WWF, but with smart people. <laughs> he finishes, he leaves, I'm running through the pits, where you saw that picture, running through the pits, I don't think he'd been gone half an hour, and the kids are very industrious in these pits. They're always making up gift bags and goodies to bribe all the judges with to win all the awards. <laughs> and I go by one of the pits, maybe 20 minutes after the president has gone, to be thanking the parents, the teachers, the mentors, and I see this kid hands me this button, first, like WWF, but with smart people. George Herbert Walker Bush, Team 1649. I said, give me some of those. So, so he gives me some, and I, I'm sending out thank you notes, and I send out one to the president, and I included a couple of these buttons. And in the note, I said, Mr. President, it was such a great line, we'd like to officially offer you the position of chief marketing officer first. <laughs> I got a very nice note back that said, due to other commitments. Uh, he's not going to be able to take that, but we may use that phrase with attribution to him anywhere we want, so here it is. Yes, the new president brings the kids and their robots to the White House. And now, since I'm really out of time, I just want to show you a, a video and give you your homework assignment. This is our 20th year. I never give up. Next year, when I ask you to raise your hands, it'll be more. But for our 20th year, as I said, we had to do something special. So we got Will I Am and the Black Eyed Peas to come and give a spectacular performance for us. And I was also told you always have to say something new when you come to TEDx that you've never said before. So here's my big news. I'm giving up my day job and I'm joining the band. <laughs> I think. But here is what you have to listen to. This is the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl of smarts, that is. It's a life-changing competition. It's kids having fun, competing, working together to dream up, design, and build robots. It's just an exhilarating feeling. It's like I'm using power tools. They're having the hardest fun they'll ever have. And they're becoming our next generation of engineers and innovators. 
first. Come out. For inspiration and recognition of science and technology, my teachers were some of the greatest influences on my life. By challenging and trusting me, these mentors got me to understand that I could do anything I put my mind to. First mentors are changing kids' lives every day. Professional engineers, teachers, parents, teaming up with young people not just to build robots, but to build confidence and self-respect. I'm around people that I can get along with, that we can talk computer lingo with. First was founded by one of our greatest inventors, Dean Kamen. Dean saw that kids mostly look up to sports heroes and movie stars. So we said, if we've got a culture now that's obsessed with sports and entertainment, let's inspire these kids to be big thinkers the same way Shaquille O'Neal can inspire them to spend dozens of hours a week bouncing a ball. Our president agrees. Scientists and engineers ought to stand side by side with athletes and entertainers as role models. And here at the White House, we're going to lead by example. We're going to show young people how cool science can be. Go! 250,000 kids aged 6 to 18 compete at all different levels. In two first Lego leagues, the first tech challenge, then at the high school level, the first robotics competition. The only difference between this sport and all the others is every kid on our teams can turn pro. There's a job out there for every one of these kids. Students who take part in FIRST are 50% more likely to go to college and twice as likely to major in science or engineering. I definitely know that I want to pursue engineering. Once they've tasted what the power of knowledge is, that it can be fun and rewarding, they won't go back. There's no doubt FIRST works. 10 or 15 or 20 years from today, some kid in those stands will have cured Alzheimer's or AIDS or cancer, or built an engine that doesn't pollute. Look at these kids. They're, they're the future. I feel like I can go and do anything I want to do because of this program. Someone took the time to guide and inspire me. It changed my life. Take some time. Go to usfirst.org. We made it easy, we package it up, we make it fun. Everybody gets more out of it than they put into it. The parents do, the teachers do, the mentors do, the sponsors do. We've got 3,500 corporate sponsors. You've got a lot of them right here in Chicago. You have a major event here in Chicago. There should be no school in this city that doesn't offer this opportunity to those kids. As you heard, it's, it's cheaper than Ritalin. You're not gonna fix the schools by whining or complaining. We're not going to fix the lack of jobs by having people that aren't capable of creating the new industries and the new jobs and then filling them. America is a great place because, in the end, we get what we deserve. We determine our own future. You people need to give the next generation a little guidance. We've got to get a little bit of their focus on things that actually matter in a culture that's a little vacuous. You can do this, and it really is fun. And whether you do that as a parent, or as a future, as an employer that's looking for a workforce, or as a citizen, or as a professional, pick your reason. We got to do this or we'll suffer the consequences because we, we could end up getting what we deserve. This country led the world since its beginning because it had people that had a work ethic, that were highly motivated, that took risks, the world has now seen how well that model works, and we seem to have forgotten it. We'd rather play the game, blame game. It's the politicians, it's the rich, it's the poor. There are no easy fixes, and whining about all these dysfunctional, discordant people ain't going to solve the problem. 
the people that get involved in first are. We're, we're proving it, but we're running out of time. An entire generation of high school is four years. We gotta get moving. So there's people downstairs from first. They'll show you how easy it is, and particularly in Chicago. It's both really easy, because we've got a lot going on here, and it's really necessary, as you've seen from some of the earlier speakers about Chicago. So please, give it a try. If you don't like it, I won't ask you to come back. Thanks.